this preacher heard, there is someone in this community rejecting God-given light, and if they do not stop, God is going to send them to hell forever. He has sent me to warn them. Now you may do as you please about this matter. I have warned you, so goodbye. This is why I'm doing this video. This is a pastor who repented of his adultery. You know, pastors commit adultery. And this was in the early 1900s, I think 1907. And the, this is the reason why I have to keep sounding the alarm. This pastor heard this in a dream as thrilling and awful words filled him with terror. So I am doing this video to try to see if you will please listen to the testimony of this pastor. And the reason why it's so important is that any day you could die and you would go to hell forever if you're in this sin. And I'm loving you enough to do a video. I hope you'll watch. I'm not the, you know, I'm not trying to entertain anybody. I'm trying to snatch someone from hell. So it happens to me all the time that I am out and about and I run into people that think they're Christians. And then when I start asking them questions about their faith, it turns out they're clearly not born again. A couple of days ago, I went to Home Depot and I was in the gardening section, actually near the shepherd's hooks. You know what those are? Those metal hooks called shepherd hooks that hang up your plants. But Jesus is our shepherd. And I was, I saw this lady there and she was talking to these guys who were playing um, Michael Jackson music really loud who were working at the thing. And I said, do you know that in the end times, uh, they're going to be using Michael Jackson. She's like, what? And I said, well, yeah, because there will be um, holographs and there will be statues that can take on, with artificial intelligence, can take on that they look like they're the real person, that it looks like it's Michael Jackson has come back from the dead. And I was telling her about how in Dallas, uh, recently Madonna did a very wicked a very wicked, as you would expect, Madonna did a very wicked concert, and that she actually read, in parts of that concert, she read parts of the book of Revelation. Can you believe that? And at the end of it, it had this, I mean, it, it, I wouldn't suggest anybody watching it. I went to go look to see just how wicked it is. I mean, there was nudity, not like full frontal nudity, but there was definitely nudity, topless and uh, bottomless backsides, okay? But at the end, it had this whole thing with um, an ode, basically, to Michael Jackson and with Madonna and Michael Jackson behind a screen, there were these people dancing that looked like Madonna and Michael Jackson. And that is what it's going to be like after the rapture. They will be bringing all these people back through artificial intelligence. I told her about how they have these statues that are uh, giant statues that right now you can go, supposedly, I don't I haven't looked into them lately, but you go to these statues and it's considered an uh, amusement and you go up in a big elevator. I think they're like three or four stories tall. It's been a long time since I've looked into it. Maybe somebody knows more about what's been going on with the statues, but they put them in these different cities and you go up and then the statue has the ability to uh, become where it looks like you. Well, it'll eventually be the Antichrist statue that they will be worshiping. They'll be worshiping Obama. Anyway, I talked to her and she believes in the rapture and she has gone to see the old Left Behind movies. She hadn't seen the newest one. And she mentioned that her fiancé is a pastor. And I said, oh, really? Where is he a pastor? And she said, oh, First Baptist Church of Atlanta. Well, I know about that church because that used to be the conservative church. 
when I grew up at Wyuka Red Baptist, which was the, we were called liberal Baptist. We called ourselves moderate Baptist, but basically we didn't believe in the inerrancy of the scripture. And we had, uh, we believed that women should be deacons and the conservative church was Charles Stanley. And they did not believe that, which of course, Andy Stanley left First Baptist of Atlanta when his dad, after his mother I think it was like six years his mother divorced Charles Stanley, and Charles Stanley was supposed to step down, and he chose not to step down. And Andy and a bunch of people left the church because it says that the pastor should not be a divorced man. He should be the running his family well and that he should be the husband of one wife. That's what the Bible says for a pastor. So anyway, this woman, Amy, she's in her 50s, and she said that her first husband she had gotten a divorce from a long time ago I think maybe 20 years ago and that she had uh he had gotten remarried she had never remarried but that she had had many 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 other men in that time and and then when I said well so tell me about this pastor well he is he's been divorced for 15 20 years himself and he's a pastor in counseling for 20-something years on staff at First Baptist of Atlanta. And she's engaged to him, is what she says. Now, could she be a liar? Possibly. I, don't, I didn't get that impression that she would be lying to me. And I said, well, don't you know that the Bible says you're not supposed to marry a divorced man and you're not supposed to divorce, that only a widow can get remarried? She said, yeah, I thought that was true, but, you know, he says he's a born-again Christian. And she goes, I'm not born again. I was like, ah. And I said, so, you know, have you been baptized? And she said, well, I got, I grew up Methodist. I got baptized when I was an infant. And, uh, you know, now that I sing in the choir and everything at First Baptist, she goes, I haven't been lately, but, um, because we're broken up at the moment, but he is the one who baptized me. The divorced pastor who she's engaged to, he had baptized her, is what she said. So I was like, she kept talking about him. I said, no, no, you know, he's in big trouble with God, but I want to try to get you saved because you're not born again. You're not saved. She goes, oh, okay. So we went through the good person test and, you know, I said, she's a liar. She's not used God's name as a cuss word, Southern Usually Southern women don't use God's name as a cuss word. We're kind of trained from very young that ladies don't talk like that. Um, We say, oh, my goodness, or goodness gracious, or that kind of thing. And she, um, you know, she had stolen something. She had coveted. We talked a lot about idolatry. She said, my idol is my job. That's what I think about all the time. She's a speech pathologist. She teaches, um, you know, children with speech impediments and stuff. And she says that a lot of the kids that she sees, she thinks that they have demons. I said, absolutely. They absolutely do. And, um, you know, but the thing is, you might think you're a good person and we're going through these tests to show that you're not. And so I said, so if you're standing before the judge, God, and you've got these sins that you're guilty. Are you innocent or guilty? She said, I'm guilty. And I said, so heaven or hell? She goes, I'm going to hell. I said, exactly. That's a, that's somebody who can really see the truth of their situation. And so I said, you know, if, if you want to go to heaven, you have to repent of these sins. You have to admit it and quit it. And, you know, people don't want to say that. They just don't want to think about that. But, you know, in Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira were struck dead by God for saying one lie. And so she says, I'm guilty. I said, the the thing is, you need to surrender completely to Jesus Christ. Ask him to forgive you and wash you clean and then go and sin no more. And really imagine yourself as that woman caught in adultery who is going to be stoned and that you need the mercy of God to forgive you. And so that you'll be able to go and sin no more. 
And I told you, you ought to get, you ought to get a list and you should just write down all the sins you can think of that you've ever committed. You know, she's in her fifties. This happened to me when I was 45, write them all down and then ask God to cleanse you and to make you a new person and to give you a new mind and a new heart to where you will run from this pastor He's not saved. He's not born again. If he were, he would not be wanting to get married to you while his first wife is still alive. He would be wanting to continue to stay unmarried and possibly reconcile with her or just stay unmarried and wait for wait for the rapture to happen. Anyway, so I wanted she's going to, you know, I'm assuming she's going to come and watch some of my videos. I thought, oh, I'll do a video about her. Her name is Amy, and she's really sweet, but she knows she's not born again. So I'm praying for her. I'm praying for her that she will get born again. Okay, so I had not looked into First Baptist Atlanta. I'm assuming they have gotten liberal over the years. And this is a premarital intake form. Eligibility for marriage slash remarriage counseling is based on the following criteria for using FBA First Baptist Atlanta facilities. One, the participants must be born again believers. Second Corinthians 6, 14, unequally yoked passage. Well, she was telling me she's not a born again believer. Hmm. Number two, the participants may not be living together or engaging in premarital sex. It is our experience that premarital sex leads to serious problems after marriage Sex outside of marriage is a sin of fornication for the single and adultery for the married. Huh, that sounds really good. Now you get to number three. This is the problem. The participants, if divorced, may be remarried only if the divorce was for the following reasons. A, the former spouse violated the principles laid out by Christ in Matthew 19 which Matthew 19 does not say if they committed adultery that you can get divorced and remarried. And Mark 10, Mark 10 says you cannot get remarried, period. That's what it says. And then B, the former spouse who was a non-believer abandoned the marriage, 1 Corinthians 7, 15. I'd already shown on the screen 1 Corinthians 7, 15 does not allow for remarriage. There is nothing in there that says for remarriage. And verse 16 says that they are still husband and wife. How may you save your husband? How may you save your wife? You're supposed to, you're still married. Abandoning the marriage does not make the the marriage covenant end. It just means you've got to constantly forgive the person. And if the person repents of abandoning or adultery or whatever, then you are to reconcile if at all possible. That's what 1 Corinthians 7, 10 and 11 says, that a woman, if she departs, must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. He doesn't stop being her husband if she abandons the marriage. Same if a man leaves his wife. He doesn't stop being her husband if he leaves. And it says in verse 11, and this is a command from the Lord. It says, a husband must not divorce his wife. Back to first, this is really bad. Back to first Baptist facilities. Number four, if you're, in other words, if you're wanting to get married in their church, number four, if one or both of the participants are divorced, he or she must be divorced for a minimum of one year before seeking premarital counseling. So basically anything goes, which is just exactly what um, Martin Luther said. Oh, you need to wait two years before you can get remarried, maybe 10 years before you can get remarried. So... Yeah, First Baptist Atlanta is deceived. They are deceived. They're twisting. They're twisting what God has to say. It's bad. And I thought, well, here is an example of a pastor 
and his testimony of how he repented after seeking God instead of listening to what all the other pastors had to tell him, what all the other Christians have to tell him. And he's got a very serious warning. It says, there is someone in this community, the church community, rejecting God-given light. And if they do not stop, God is going to send them to hell forever. He has sent me to warn them. Now, you may do as you please about this matter. I have warned you, so goodbye. That basically was, you know, an angel messenger in the dream. And the thing is, God speaks through people, and God speaks through angels, and God speaks through dreams. So I hope you'll listen to this. I I put this um, testimony up before, but really, there are so many pastors who are divorced and remarried or pastors who are considering getting remarried, or pastors who are performing marriage, you know, weddings for people that are divorced or remarried that have no business getting remarried. And this has been going on for a very long time. This testimony was, he was from the 1900s, early 1900s. And, you know, it goes back through American history. We've had, Andrew Jackson was married to a divorced woman. And that was a whole scandal back then. But it has been so acceptable, and it just gets more and more and more acceptable when it's not acceptable to God. God says it's an abomination. So I want to read his testimony again. I hope you really will listen and take it to heart. And if you don't listen, I don't have any blood on my hands. And I do really feel for the people who are divorced. You know, I am divorced. My husband divorced me. Um, April 6th, oh, excuse me, April 7th will be his 12th divorce marriage wedding. Of course, we weren't there. My kids were not there. He kept a secret, but he had all of his family there. All these Christians, all these Baptists, you know, they were all at this wedding. And she got baptized the week before they got married by Andy Stanley's church. You know, he baptized her in her adulterous engagement to my husband. And then the next week they got married on uh, the Saturday before Easter. April 8th was Easter in 2012. And then the next week was when Andy Stanley preached When Gracie Met Truthy, which was really a story about his hairdresser and how her husband left her and the kids for a a, a, um, a male lover. And that Andy Stanley said, you know, that he she got really mad about it, which she should, and that, Andy was waiting for the divorce to be final before the gay men could serve in the church. This is in 2012. So where's Andy Stanley now, right? It's gotten worse and worse and worse. And so, yeah, it's... he. In fact, Andy did a sermon saying he wished that everybody in the church was gay because the gay people serve in the church better than all the rest. Anyway... I've met with Andy Stanley twice. He's not saved himself. He is not saved. It's not that he's fallen away. He's never gotten saved. He's never been born again. But you can be born again and fall away because there is a, you know, there is free will. You have to choose each day to surrender to the Lord. If you start to compromise on sin, you can grieve the Holy Spirit. You can quench the Holy Spirit and he will leave you. And when people say that he, there's no way that he could leave you, why is it then that King David in Psalm 51 said, please, God, do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Here, King David, who had been anointed, and then he committed adultery one time with Bathsheba, and he also had his her husband killed. That was terrible to God. And so he begged God not to let the Holy Spirit be taken from him. So, yes, the Holy Spirit can be in you. And I know it says you're sealed until the day of redemption. 
but it's a cooperation with the Holy Spirit. It's a cooperation to not harden your heart against what God is warning you about and to obey him, to love and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. Okay, so here we're going to go with his testimony and I hope that Amy's watching, and I hope that you will listen to it again if you've already heard it, because this is real. This is real life. God gave him a message that he would go to hell for living in in a remarriage, that God calls it adultery. I was born June 30th, 1872, a few miles south of Memphis, Tennessee, and I spent the earlier part of my life in and about that section. He must have had a southern accent. (laughs) At the age of 19, I was married to a young lady of 17. She was then an excellent girl. About four years later, we moved to Chicago, Illinois. Oh, where the Antichrist is is from. Mm -hmm. He was a senator from, from there. Yeah. Where we were both converted and sanctified and lived a happy Christian life for some time. But as time passed, my wife grew cold and indifferent and finally renounced all religious scruples and went into open sin and uncleanness to such extent that I was forced to put her away, according to Matthew 5.32. Well, this right here tells you that once saved, always saved is not true, right? This is apostasy, falling away, falling away. It is falling away. And, uh, you know, we have free will to choose to obey Christ every day and pursue our relationship with Jesus Christ, or we choose to fall away. When the Bible says no one can snatch us out of his hand, no, you know, no outside force can snatch us out of his hand, but we can choose to renounce him and to uh, live according to our flesh or to, um, you know, when we pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, we can continually fall to temptation where we are then grieving the Holy Spirit, grieving the Holy Spirit. Okay, so back to uh, Mr. Humphrey's testimony. So he was putting her, I was forced to, quote, put her away, divorce, according to Matthew 5, 32. However, I remained unmarried, having been instructed by the Bible and my religious teachers that there were biblical grounds to put away the unclean party, but none, it should be whatsoever, to remarry while she lived. So I believed and taught this for years. He's a preacher from the pulpit and through the press. So he remained a preacher even though he was divorced. But later on, I read more largely on the subject, and I met many, many holy, devout men as I went forth in the, evangel- in the evangelistic work. We are to do the work of evangelist, who were more experienced both in the Word and in ministry than I, and who believed there were Bible grounds for the quote, innocent party to remarry under my circumstances, taking, and I'm going to pause, I'm going to pause it right here and read you, for example, Matthew 5, 32, which is what he was uh, first referring to. This is in the Geneva Bible in 1599. But I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife except it be for fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. That's in 1599, Geneva Bible, before the King James Version, which I think was in 1611. Okay? Now, just look at this. Whosoever shall put his his wife, except it be for fornication... This is referring to the Jewish betrothal. 
And how do we know this? We know this from Matthew chapter 1. Because Joseph was going to put away quietly Mary when he found out that she was pregnant. How could he be putting her away for adultery? It wouldn't be adultery because he wasn't yet his, they had not consummated their marriage. They were in a betrothal marriage, a betrothal marriage, which was legally binding for the Jews where they uh, were considered husband and wife. They had taken the vows. They had uh, drunk a cup of wine that she accepted the terms of the marriage. He had paid the price to her dad to keep her as his betrothed, um, his betrothed virgin in, in the house of her father until he came to get her at a later time, which is why Jesus is coming to get his bride that he is betrothed to at a later time. He's been up in heaven, John 14, 1 through 4, uh, creating our heavenly homes that he's coming to take us to. But for Joseph, he was going to put away Mary for, not for adultery, for fornication, premarital sex, the virgin losing her virginity during the betrothal marriage. And, of course, in Mary, and Mary is the only one <laughs> who was had not lost her virginity because she had had an immaculate conception of, of Jesus Christ in her womb being born and conceived by the Holy Spirit. But in a normal case, a Jewish man who was betrothed, if his virgin had fornicated, he would put her away. And then he was free to marry again because he had never actually um, uh, consummated that marriage with her. So that except for fornication is not except for adultery. And the reason why we know it is that it would say in the same sentence where it says, And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. That's adultery used twice in one sentence, and fornication is definitely not adultery. Or they would, it would say, except it be for adultery, causeth her to commit adultery. Is a very important verse to me because, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. So when my husband leaves and divorces me, I'm still married because... I did not, he did not have uh, grounds to divorce me, even if I had committed adultery and he divorced me for that. I, he still does not have grounds to get remarried because, um, or for me to get remarried, either one, because the marriage is still intact in God's eyes, as we will find out. Okay, so he was talking about the innocent party. Um, also, here is even earlier than that, Matthew 5.32 in Wycliffe Bible, 1395. But I say to you that every man that leaveth his wife, that every man that shall leave his wife, except for the cause of adultery, no, sexual morality, no, fornication, premarital sex, maketh her do to do lechery and he that weddeth the forsaken wife doeth adultery. Okay. But that's the Wycliffe Bible, Matthew five thirty two. That is not what the new translations have to say. But even if the new translation said, except for sexual morality, we know it's not adultery because it would say adultery. It would say, except for the cause of adultery. You know, Jesus is not stupid. Jesus is accurate. He's very accurate. And still, even if it were, you know, even when it says except for sexual morality, most of the versions do give part B of the verse correctly, that he who weddeth the divorced wife or the forsaken wife doeth adultery. 
lot of people try to say, oh, it's just a one-time thing. Just when they first get married, then it's adultery. But God forgives that. No, it's doeth. It's practicing adultery every single day that you are in a second marriage, third marriage, fourth marriage, whatever. Every single day is committeth or doeth adultery. So he, he believed and taught this for years from the pulpit and through the press. But later on, I read more largely on the subject and met many holy, devout men as I went forth in the evangelistic work who were more experienced in word and ministry than I and who believed there were Bible grounds for the innocent party to remarry under my circumstances. And they were taking Matthew nineteen nine for their authority. Also, I saw in the discipline of all Orthodox churches that they recognized one ground vis-a-vis Matthew 19.9. So as I did not hold myself as any criterion after weighing the matter in these different scales, I finally concluded that I was wrong and that my views on the subject were non-scriptural. So I publicly confessed my mistake and accepted the general view of the Christian world. Now, you realize this is, um, he is in the early 1900s when he's doing this. So this is after the Reformation. And the Reformers, the Protestant Reformers, did not get um, did not get this right. This is one of the things, you know, the Protestant Reformers kept infant baptism. Um, they were, in general, they were cessationist. They did not believe in the spiritual gifts. They um, did not get this right. And partly it was because, well, a lot of it was because of Erasmus, who was a Catholic humanist monk who uh, did the translation of the Greek into Latin. But Erasmus ended up influencing Martin Luther, who was the father of the Reformers. And Martin Luther, beside being an anti-Semite, he was also, he had written documents with advice or counsel that were based on Erasmus's extra-biblical documents. And Martin Luther said, if you divorced, you had to wait two to ten years, and after the two to ten years, then you could get remarried. And so, of course, all these Protestant Reformed people all were looking at Martin Luther and thinking, oh, you know, but Martin Luther also said we're saved by faith through grace alone. There is no uh, alone. There's no verse with that that says that. No verse. And Martin Luther also did not want the book of James in the in the Bible because James says faith without works is dead. And he, he didn't want the book of Revelation in the Bible either. Why is that? Because Jesus himself said to five of the seven churches that they must repent. He also said only those who are overcomers would be going to heaven. So Martin Luther was not a good, not, not good, not good. Better than Catholicism, but still not good. So As I was the innocent party, after living a single life for seven years, I felt as clear as heaven to take a second wife, basing my foundation on Matthew 19.9. However, some of my friends advised me differently, but their advice came too late. But the very next day, after the ceremony was performed, I felt strangely. I did not feel that sky-blue clearness. I felt a little smitten in spirit. However, I was, the Lord was very tender and patient with me and would bless and pour out his spirit upon me, knowing I was ignorant of my mistake. But as time passed by, this annoyance became a constant thing. So I would set myself apart for a few days of prayer and fasting, at which time my sky would clear up as bright as noon and all was well. But when I would resume the former routine of life, things would darken up again. So this continued for about five months in this alternate way. However, I was as honest as an angel in the matter, believing I had God's highest approval in the step I had taken. But after the first five months of our married life, the thing became a real doubt. 
So I resolved to set myself apart by prayer and as much fasting as I deemed prudent, for I wanted to know from God. First, if I'd really made a mistake... And if there were really no grounds for divorce marriages, you know, I actually think it's better than remarriage, that term, divorce marriages. Second, I wanted to know if it was wrong, what step to take to get out of it. (laughs) As it would no doubt be a great stumbling block to the unsaved. However, I was fully determined to God in spite of men or the devil even at the loss of all things, even life itself. You know, Jesus said we must be willing to lose our life in order to gain eternal life. We have to be completely surrendered to the Lord Jesus as our, not just our Savior, our Lord, that we love him and obey him. So we lived a separate life for 18 months, waiting for the clear, unmistakable mind of God. However, but little of my time was spent at home. I was engaged in evangelistic work with the blessing of God wonderfully upon my soul. We read in Job 33, 14 through 18, these words. God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. In a dream, all of y'all who think that God doesn't give people dreams, in a vision of the night, When deep sleep falleth upon men, and sealeth their instruction, he keepeth back his soul from the pit, and his life from perishing by the sword. Truly the Lord has verified this in my case, as he has used this special method, together with the word, of warning, instructing, and reproving me ever since I was saved. I confess all visions and dreams are not to be depended upon, Yet God has a way of making one know when he is speaking. So here, give the reader in substance what God said to me, or in other words, some methods he used by dreams and visions to make me, to make me know I was wrong in my divorce marriage. I do not force it upon anyone. I only relate it and let you take it for what it is worth. It is to be remembered. I did not receive all of this in one night or in one month, but from time to time during a period of 18 months and upward. First, on the night of April 13th. Oh, April 13th. Hmm. Interesting. 412 is, there is uh, Acts 412. April 13th, 1907. The Spirit came to me in a dream or vision in the form of an eminent preacher who lives an exceptionally holy life. However, I do not know his views on this subject. And quoted clearly and distinctly two passages of Scripture. The first one is found in Isaiah 52, 11. Depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence, touch no unclean thing, go ye out of the midst of her, be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. The next passage is found in 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. These came not as other flighty dreams, but were stamped on my mind and by the invincible power of the spirit. Hence, I can never forget them. Of course, when you get a dream and it's got scripture in it, you know, God speaking to you. Number two, on, on the night of, on September 28th, 1907, in my dream, I stood on the sidewalk of a solitary street. I saw no one for miles around, but suddenly a being from another world descended and sat on top of a building just across the street from where I stood and began talking in a loud, clear, thrilling, and awful words, such as filled me with terror For they seemed not only words, but stuck fast in my soul like arrows. He spake as follows. There is someone in this community rejecting God-given light. And if they do not stop, God is going to send them to hell forever. He has sent me to warn them. Now you may do as you please about this matter. I have warned you, so goodbye. Wow. Yeah. That is the message. 
After he was through speaking, he transformed into the likeness of a large bird and ascended into the sky. Immediately I woke, awoke filled with confusion, terror, and conviction beyond the power of language to describe. I related it to my wife and told her what God was not pleased with our marriage, but she did not seem to take it in that light. Hence the sad news almost broke her heart. So I did leave her then. Okay, so before he was separated, but he was uh, separated, you know, from the bedroom, but not actually had left the house. So I did leave her then as I wanted to be sure it was God talking and not the enemy. So I decided to pray for God to make it clearer still. However, we continued to live clean and separate. Number three, another night I saw... In my dream, a large white boat at sea, which I believe represented the safe Bible way, kind of like a large white ark. But I had left this boat and had taken a narrow skiff, which I believe misrepresented that one isolated passage of Scripture, Matthew 19, 9, which is the only passage in the Bible that seems to give grounds for divorce marriage. And I was rapidly drifting away from the large lifeboat. As I drifted, my little boat became uncontrollable and rapidly leaped on over the angry, turbulent waves until I gradually began to sink, and I went down to a watery grave. I awoke with a sense of God's displeasure on divorce marriages beyond the power of description. But as I wanted to be sure and not make another mistake, I decided to still keep the matter before God so as to obtain his clear, unmistakable leading. I want to say right here, strange as it may seem, God kept his blessing on my soul, for he knew I wanted to know his will and I would do it. Hence, the patience he had with me in convincing me of the wrongness of this matter was something marvelous. God is gracious. He has so much mercy for us. The great trouble with this It was such a legalized sin. He's talking about 1907. Yeah, we. I thought it was, I mean, it it has gotten much more rampant, but it was legalized sin then. Among almost all classes, even the strictest and most devout people of earth, with a few exceptions, that was, that it was difficult to renounce and go against their smooth words and plausible arguments on the subject. I plainly saw if I took the way God was holding up, I would have to take a dead stand against the majority of preachers and holiness teachers of our day. The holiness teachers will tell you to be holy about everything except for adultery marriages. Another thing that made it so difficult to take away, take the way of the spirit was holding up was I did not want to be a turncoat, i.e., I had known this light on the divorce subject before and was led by shallow teachers to renounce it. But God showed me, notwithstanding the fact, I had to take his clear, uncompromising way, no matter what men or devils would say. It would be better to turn a thousand times and be right than never turn and be wrong. So true. Number four, another night in my dream, I saw myself joined arms with my second wife walking down a wide brimstone road in hell. And as we passed a large vestibule, I saw throngs of voluptuous men all dressed in black and wearing silk hats. They were all keeping time to a band of music and waving college banners and singing this chorus course this in real life hell is not going to be like this at all in hell at last in hell at last and earth and all her pleasures past in hell at last in hell at last for i i the die is cast and in front of these men were about a dozen large black swine pigs emblems of filth and uncleanness and they were flopping their ears and cringing to the music In this, God showed me that I had followed the sensual, unclean, flesh-indulging multitudes of earth into this divorce marriage business. As I awoke with that awful picture burning in my brain and that hellish music ringing in my ears, 
But as it meant so much to make another public confession and say I had made a mistake by remarrying while my former wife lived, I thought perhaps these were only dreams. And I had better pray some more before I had made what seemed such a fatal step. Boy, I mean, really, I would have said one dream, two dreams, that would have been enough for me to know. But anyway, so I decided to spend some more days in fasting and some more all night in prayer before God to know the unmistakable truth about this matter. Number five, one day as I stood all alone in the parlor of a friend's house in an eastern city while contemplating taking up this awful cross, it seemed as though a glorified spirit descended and sang the following chorus to me. I never heard the words or the tune until then. Heaven is cheap at any cost. Do gain its ports or all is lost. For earthly gain is only dross and naughts of value but the cross. And with this song, there seemed to come volleys of exhortations from Wesley, Fletcher, Pollock, and millions of glorified saints saying to me, Gain heaven's port at any cost. For several days afterwards, an inexpressible heavenly melting was upon me, and that angelic song was ringing in my ears. Since then, I've had the song put to music and put into our song book, Revival, Fire, and Song. I did look for it, but I haven't found it. It can be had at our office for 15 cents. After this invincible message, I was not only convinced that the divorce marriage was wrong, but also thoroughly convinced that we had to separate fully. So we began to plan and work to that end. However, we kept praying for still clear evidence so that after years, there would be nothing to regret over taking this step. Of course, after many of our friends and brethren heard that we decided to separate, they came to us by letter or in presence and tried to reason us out of our conviction by defining what divorces meant and by saying that what Jesus must have meant, they meant well, but their arguments were too shallow to build on for eternity. We saw one woman die in this divorce trap. She was a good Christian woman and professed holiness too, but we have never seen such a distressed, forlorn, God-forsaken looking being before or since. Oh, friends, we cannot afford to take any doubtful position in regard to our eternal welfare. Preachers and people can reason us on to the false track and into hell, but they cannot reason us out. That's why most preachers are going to hell themselves. So my advice to everyone is take the clearest track to heaven. Of course, it may be the most unpopular and may bring lots of persecution, but after all, it's the safest way to the pearly gates. Number six, one night in my dream, two preachers came to me. One I thought was St. Paul. And as they stood near me, the other preacher said to me, and as they stood near me, the other preacher read to me from a paper which he held in his hand the following in substance. You would be all right if it were not for that divorce marriage. As this, they, at this they disappeared, and I awoke with these awful words ringing in my ear. You would be all right if it were not for that divorce marriage. And while lying there thinking upon these awful words, a strange feeling seized me as if it was death. I was conscious, but I could not speak or move. As I struggled to make efforts to free myself, I found something holding me fast. God seemed to put this question at me. How would you like for this to be death and you tied up in that divorce marriage? As I lay there and struggled, all I could see, filling the whole horizon of my mind, was that divorce marriage. From this, God caused me to see that a soul could not afford to go to their deathbed with the least conviction on their heart or a shadow of doubt in their experience. Number seven, the following night in my dream, I was standing in a large yard all alone. And while thus standing, it seemed that God was so angry with me because of my divorce marriage that a great stream of lightning swept down from heaven and ran on the ground to meet me 
in thousands of fiery spangles. It picked me up literally and carried me about 30 feet to a huge, a large heap of fire burning on the ground and held me fast in those flames. When I awoke, I still seemed to be on fire. Even the bed seemed hot with those wrathful flames. As I was awakening, I heard these words out of that avalanche of lightning. Prepare to meet thy God. This occurred. This occurred while I was away in another town. I went home and told my wife and we mutually agreed to separate. Since we did so, I feel as clear as an angel and I am fully convinced that divorce marriages are wrong, no matter if every preacher in the universe says that they are not. I have been in hell, so to speak, for almost two years on account of listening to false teachers. Oh, friend, do not be deceived by any preacher or teacher. It is wrong beyond a shadow of a doubt. If I had the voice of an archangel, I would sound it from pole to pole. I came near to losing my soul by giving ear to these false teachers rather than to God. Of course, many of them are good, well-meaning Christian men, but they're only giving their opinions and also what that isolated passage in Matthew 19, 9 seems to mean. But I have been caught in the snare of the thing, and God has been hurling light and conviction on my soul for nearly two years, day and night, making me know and feel that the thing is wrong. I am not writing what I think, but what I positively know, and I am writing to seal this testimony with my blood. I know whereof I speak, and no matter how conferences or church disciplines may rock the conscience of people to sleep, telling them they can marry while their husbands and wives live. They are wrong. And the souls whom they are deceiving will find out when eternity is unveiled, if not before. And of course, I believe the rapture is going to happen any day. And that is when they're going to find out they miss the rapture because they are wrong on div- adultery marriages, divorce marriages. I thank God he kept conviction and light streaming from heaven on my soul until I walked in it, in spite of all the false comforters who were crying, peace, peace, when there is no peace, but dread, fear, and awful uncertainty. Now, precious eternity-bound friend, will you take the advice of one who has acted the fool? A lot of foolish virgins are in these... uh, I call them adultery marriages, but divorce marriages. And never, never enter into a divorce marriage under any circumstances. And if you are now in one and love your soul and want to gain heaven, do get out of it. Do get out of it. Even at the cost of all things or else you will regret it for all eternity. Hell is eternal. And also for people who don't think that, you know, God gives people dreams, it says in Acts 2, 17 and 18, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. Cessationists are wrong. They're flat out wrong. We are able to prophesy in these days. We do have dreams and visions. And, um, you know, my channel was started because I, I had my first dream about the rapture on March 16th of 2017, and April 26th will be seven years since I did my very first video. And in that video, I said that I was keeping my vows, which now I've kept my vows for all, it'll be 42 years on June 26. So this pastor was telling the truth and um, do not be deceived. No matter what the modern church says, repentance is still necessary to be saved and holiness is still required to get into heaven, you know. Nothing unclean is going into heaven. When he says, get away from the unclean, do not touch the unclean. That is, we must be set apart 
to, to the Lord Jesus to be his bride, pure and spotless. Jude one twenty two, And you must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. Rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. Show mercy to still others, but do so with great caution, hating the sins that contaminate their lives. Then um, now all glory to God, who is able to keep you from falling away. See why once saved, always saved is not true will keep you from falling away and will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. All glory to him who alone is God, our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord. All glory, majesty, power, and authority are his before all time and in the present and beyond all time. Amen. You know, you think about it. We have assurance of our our salvation as we continue the walk, right? But Mr. Humphreys could have chosen not, he could have chosen to go with the crowd, but he chose to seek what God's will is. And God illuminated to him using dreams, which was also in Job 33, illuminated to him that He was being led astray by all the false teachers. So that is the difference, you know. It's not once saved, always saved. But it is assurance that you know that your Heavenly Father, if you seek Him with all your heart, He will show you if you're getting off the path. And He will put you back on the narrow road when you are surrendered to Him. He will. He loves you. He wants you to make it. He wants you to make it in the rapture. But you can't harden your heart towards him. You can't harden your heart towards your spouse. You can't be unforgiving and unloving and and, uh, fall away. So it's definitely not once saved, always saved. And in Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira were both struck dead. For one lie in the church. God struck them dead for lying to the Holy Spirit in the church. If God were to do that, I'm not saying he will, because I think there are going to be a lot of people that end up coming to the knowledge of the truth after the rapture, after they miss the rapture. But if God were to do that on the day, say the day of the rapture, Maybe 2% of people who claim to be Christians are actually born again and filled with the Holy Spirit and living holy. They disappear. How many could God just say, that's it, and strike them dead? You know, really, it's not, it's not time to play games with God. It's not time to put off what, you, what sin you're living in, whatever sin it is. It's not time to put putting it off. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to repent and be converted. Acts 3.19. Today's the day to do Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sin, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Stop sinning. Stop sinning. It's not worth it. It's not worth being left behind. It's not worth going to hell. You don't know what day you're going to die. We have to prophesy. We have to warn. We have to tell people Jesus is coming, and this is a cancerous disease among Christians. Ezekiel three seventeen through 21. Whenever you receive a message from me, warn people immediately. And if I warn the wicked, saying, you are under, under the penalty of death, but you fail to deliver the warning, They will die in their sins, and I will hold you responsible for their deaths. If you warn them and they refuse to repent and keep on sinning, they will die in their sins. But you will have saved yourself because you obeyed me. It's not always fun, but it needs to be done. Yeah. Hey, how about that? I just made a little rhyme. It's not always fun, but it needs to be done. It's not fun. 
to go and confront someone, but it's love. It is love to love your neighbor enough to warn them. Verse 20, if righteous people turn away from their righteous behavior and ignore the obstacles I put in their way, they will die. And if you do not warn them, they will die in their sins. None of their righteous acts will be remembered. Another case of why it's not once saved, always saved. None of their righteous acts will be remembered, and I will hold you responsible for their deaths. But if you warn righteous people not to sin and they listen to you and do not sin, they will live and you will have saved yourself too. Hallelujah. So that's the thing. I'm warning. I'm warning. I'm not self-righteous. I'm righteous through the blood of Jesus. And I'm warning you to live holy. But if you... You know, most people probably don't even watch the first three minutes of a video. But if you're still here and I'm warning you and you choose not to listen, I don't have your blood on my hands. Colossians 3, 1. If then you have been raised with Christ to a new life, thus sharing his resurrection from the dead, aim at and seek the rich eternal treasures that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God and set your minds and keep them set on what is above the higher things, not on the things that are on the earth. For as far as this world is concerned, you have died and your new real life is hidden with Christ in God. You know, I just kind of, I kind of think about, I mean, we don't know the day and the hour when the rapture is going to happen. We are supposed to be living as if he could come today or we could die today, making the most of every day as the days are evil. But really, can you imagine if the rapture were to happen on the day of the solar eclipse? I know, you know, the rest of the world doesn't care that much about the great American solar eclipse. But back in, um, well, of course, we had the one in 2017. The one that we had, the one before that, I believe it was in 1918. And there was a National Day of Repentance proclamation made and signed by the president. I can't remember. I think I want to say it was Woodrow Wilson. I'm not sure who the president was. But there was a National Day of Repentance, a holiday, a day of repentance for America uh, right before that eclipse happened. All these people are looking up and looking at this solar eclipse. And if the rapture were to happen on that day, that really truly would be very interesting. But we don't know the day. But we are to be looking up with our minds set on Jesus Christ, not the things of the earth. Even though it's absolutely awesome how God made the sun, the moon, the stars, and put them in the exact perfect places, which is why the earth is not flat. You know, there's a, a solar, when a solar eclipse happens, the moon, now you think about it too, it's like all these Christians who say, oh, you know, God looks at the circle of the earth. Well, doesn't the moon look like a circle? It does, but it's not. It's a sphere. It's a globe but you know it basically looks like a circle the sun looks like a circle the sun is 400 times larger than the moon and then it's 400 times farther away I guess from the moon to where I'm not I I know the number's 400 I can't remember exactly the how this works but you know when the moon goes in front of the sun to make the solar eclipse How beautiful is it that God made them the exact circle, exact circle, and the exact size to be um, that the moon is covering up the sun in a total solar eclipse. And then in a lunar eclipse, when the Earth's shadow goes over the moon, you can see the curvature of of the Earth on the moon, making a blood moon. 
So it would be an awesome day for the rapture to happen at the eclipse. And maybe then people would really recognize um, that they were wrong about who Jesus is. And there will be there will be a great multitude that gets saved during the tribulation. But like, you know, I go around, it's like it, last night I I uh I ended up talking to a lady at Lowe's. Um she asked me, like, what what church do you go to? I said, God told me to stop going to churches in twenty eighteen because they're full of hypocrites, adulterers, fornicators, homosexuals. They're all full of they're all full of corruption. She's like I was wondering because I'm new to Atlanta and I was just thinking about trying to find a church, but that makes perfect sense why you don't go to church anymore. I said, no. And I gave her my letter and I gave her, are you good enough to go to heaven gospel tract? And, you know, we walked out to the parking lot together and everything. And it was really pretty cool. And then I went to Taco Bell. I hadn't been to Taco Bell in a long, long time. And I ended up talking to the young man there about the, Things that are going to be coming after the... I mean, he had not heard about the rapture. He did not know about um, what a... He did not know what a guillotine was. And, yeah, he was very interested. And it was, since it was late at night, there was nobody there. I got to talk to him. Well, I mean, eventually a car came up in the drive-thru. But I got to talk to him for a while. And he was like, wow, nobody's ever talked to me like this. That is what I'm trying to say, y'all. We need to be telling people. We really need to be shouting it from the rooftop. And then going back to Colossians 3, 3. For as far as this world is concerned, you have died and your real new life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears... Then you will also appear with him in the splendor of his glory. So kill, deaden, deprive of power, the evil desire lurking in your members, those animal impulses with all that is earthly in you that is employed in sin. It's working in sin. Sexual vice, impurity, sensual appetites, unholy desires, and all greed and covetousness, for that is idolatry. The deifying of self, like making yourself God, and other created things instead of God, that is idolatry. I always say like the whatever you love the most is your idol, but I like that. The deifying of self and other created things instead of God. It is on account of these very sins that the holy anger of God is ever coming upon the sons of disobedience, those who are obstinately opposed to the divine will of God, among whom you also once walked when you were living in and addicted to such practices. That's why I say, you know, we all were living in sin until we came to Jesus Christ, all of us. But now that we've come to Jesus Christ, but now put away and rid yourselves completely of all these things, anger, rage, bad feelings towards others, curses and slander and foul mouth abuse and shameful utterance from your lips. I always have to um, bring up this thing. A lot of people don't even understand what slander is, but slander is is making up lies about people like like making up lies it's not the same thing as to say a public publicly that a person especially someone who is a preacher or someone who is claiming to be a believer it's to say that they are committing adultery is not slandering them it's the truth it's it's not making an unfounded accusation it's bringing light to the truth of the sin that a person is in going back to trying to snatch them from the flames of judgment. You know, Jesus said, whatever I whisper to you in the night, to shout it from the rooftops. He said to have no, no, uh, do not participate with the things of the darkness, rather expose them. That's Ephesians 5.11. 
back to Colossians 3, 9. Do not lie to one another, for you have stripped off the old unregenerate self with its evil practices. And what I am trying to tell you is that people who are telling you you can stay in a divorce and remarriage, they are lying to you, which shows they are not regenerated. A regenerate has is going to obey God and stop lying. But if you keep on lying, you are not a child of God. And you've lied to yourself if you think that you can stay in a in an adultery marriage, a divorce marriage. You're lying to yourself, and you're listening to people lying to you. And all of you liars are all feeling good about yourselves when God says he hates it. Verse 10, And have clothed yourselves with the new spiritual self, which is ever in the process of being renewed and remolded into fuller and more perfect knowledge Upon knowledge after the image and likeness of him, Jesus Christ, who created it. In this new creation, all distinctions vanish. There is no room for there, never, for there is neither Jew or Greek, circumcised nor uncircumcised, nor difference between nations, whether alien, barbarians, or Scythians, who are the most savage of all, nor slave or free man, but Christ is all and in all and everything and everywhere to all men without distinction of of person. Clothe yourselves, therefore, as God's own chosen ones, his own picked representatives, who are purified and holy and well-beloved by God himself, by putting on behavior marked by tender-hearted pity and mercy, kind feeling, a lowly opinion of yourselves, gentle ways, and in patience, which is tireless and long-suffering, and has the power to endure whatever comes with good temper. You know, it reminds me of, uh, it's in James also, that it's, I think it's in James, it might be in Peter, where it talks about, you know, that we're supposed to endure these persecutions, um, that it's part of being a Christian. We're supposed to endure the pure, uh, the persecutions with, you know, our faith and grace and, and um, realizing that it is by grace that he even put us in this position of wanting to obey him. And that perhaps others that will come to the knowledge of the truth. You know, I think about Stephen being stoned. And he was basically the same as Jesus saying, you know, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. It's a spiritual battle, right? It's a spiritual battle. They don't realize what they're doing. Colossians 3.14 And above all these, put on love and enfold yourselves with the bond of perfectness, which binds everything together completely in ideal harmony. What a beautiful verse. And let the peace, the soul harmony which comes from Christ rule, act as umpire continually. You think about it, you know, you got the umpire saying, no, 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 yes, yes. In your hearts, deciding and settling with finality all questions that arise in your minds in that peaceful state to which, as members of Christ, one body, you were also called to live, and be thankful, appreciative, giving praise to God always. It's a new life. It's a new life. It's a glorious life in Jesus Christ. Let the word spoken by Christ, the Messiah, have its home in your hearts and minds and dwell in you all its richness as you teach and admonish and train one another in all insight and intelligence and wisdom in spiritual things. And as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody to God with his grace in your hearts. 
And whatever you do, no matter what it is, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus and in dependence upon his person, giving praise to God the Father through him. So that is Colossians 3. On the screen, I have Isaiah 54, 5. For your maker is your husband, and the Lord of hosts is his name, and the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer, the God of the whole earth he is called. So thank you for watching, doing Bible study with me, and really, repentance is a good thing. It's a good thing. It's the only way that we come to Jesus is recognizing how much we have sinned against a holy God. And he says, truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men and women everywhere to repent. That's Acts 17.30. I hope that you see that this is done in love and that by the grace of God, you can be saved. But it's time. It is time to get right with the Lord as we see the day approaching. God bless you. Thanks for watching. And if you are um, already that you know the Lord, look up. Our redemption draws nigh. Woohoo! Maranatha. God bless y'all. I'll be praying for y'all. Bye-bye.